Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our uh, webinar. Uh, as you know, these, uh, we have been in touch with uh, your um, focal points, Ms. Nurjan team for uh, basically uh, to understand your needs and uh, requests for further, uh, let's say, online capacity building within the context of our integrated language planning project, ELU project for IH Basin. Of course, we were hoping that we could do this type of trainings in person as it's much more useful and uh, also more interactive, but unfortunately, Considering the situation, it was not possible so far, but not to waste any more time, and especially because our project is relatively a small project and will end in a couple of months. We didn't want to uh, wait any further and uh, lose any more time. That's why, uh, with the help of our great uh, experts, uh, Ingrid Hirsch and Cesar Garcia, we managed somehow to continue this a series of webinars online. So as you probably seen, the first webinar uh, was already done about the eLoop concept and what we really mean by integrated land use planning, the methodologies and how we would like to develop the scenarios, what are different parts of uh, the integrated land use planning and what we have done so far within the context of this project. Uh, as you probably know, we did socioeconomical analysis, we did some soil sampling with your help, and we are now waiting also for the results so we can uh, come up with some sort of uh, scenario development. As you probably know, this is a TCP project and uh, under this TCP project, which is technical cooperation facility done by FAO, it is not possible to do the whole integrated language planning methodology. So we have chosen uh, basically two um, different um, parts of the, the whole plan, like uh, socioeconomic analysis and, and the soil sampling, as I mentioned, to develop later on the scenarios. But anyway, these uh, series of uh, webinars are somehow part of also our uh, project and we hope that you will benefit from this online. Please feel free to ask questions. We hope that it will be an interactive discussion as well. Uh, our experts will give their presentations, but then there will be also some time given for questions and answers. I'm sure Ingrid will explain how uh, today's webinar is organized. I don't want to take uh, more of your time. I, I just wanted to welcome you, of course, this uh, webinar will be later on uploaded uh, as well online. So for those colleagues who couldn't make it today, uh, we uh, encourage that you send them later on the link so they can listen to the recordings. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much for uh, your time and I wish you a very fruitful webinar. So I'll give the floor to Ingrid. And I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself, but I believe most of you already know me. So I, I just for uh, records again, I'm Sarah Marjani, the London Water Officer for our FAO office in Central Asia, uh, based in Ankara for Central Asia and Turkey. Thank you and back to you, Ingrid. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Ingrid, Ingrid Traig. I'm a FAO international consultant and I will share my screen. There we are. Good. Okay, thank you for being here. And it's a pleasure to give this webinar. As Sarah said, this is a second web the second webinar of five that we have um, organized. It's called Fundamentals of GIS for Land Use Planning. <clears throat> There it is. <clears throat> the first one, as Sarah said, was already recorded and the video was uploaded in FAO's webpage. It was uh, about the methodological framework. And today we are in the second webinar, which is about using GIS for land use planning. The third webinar will be held on August 31st. 
it will be about Google Earth engine as a geoprocessing tool. You will have to, I don't know if you can hear my cat, but he wants to enter and if I don't let him in. <laughs> Sorry. He will be uh, all, all, all the webinar talking. <laughs> okay, so the third webinar will be on August 31st, will be about Google Earth Engine, <clears throat> which is a geoprocessing uh, cloud-based platform, really useful to obtain a lot of uh, information and processing information in, in, in Google's cloud. <clears throat> Sorry. The fourth webinar will be about uh, learning degradation neutrality indicators using these indicators in land use planning with a special emphasis on land productivity trends, which is one of these indicators. And the last webinar will be about using R software for analyzing spatial, spatial data and um, digital soil mapping. I, uh, the idea of these webinars is that one builds on the other and that after this last webinar, we will have an in, uh, um, a training uh, on digital soil mapping in which we will use all of these tools. So <clears throat> the idea is to, to start building on for this last uh, training on digital soil mapping. As I said, the first webinar is already uploaded. Here is the, the um, the web page in which you can find it. There are three videos. And the last video, the third video, which is um, the one that I prepared, is also an introduction, introduction for this webinar in which uh, I talk about all these tools. So if you already seen it, great. Okay, so today we will have four parts. I will start with an introduction uh, on GIS. And then Cesar Garcia will uh, give a practical demonstration on how to use QGIS for land use planning and working with vector data. Then I will again uh, take the floor to give an introduction on using satellite derived data. And finally, we will have a practical, uh, another practical uh, session with digital elevation models and other um, and different variables that can be uh, derived from these models. So, let's start. Uh, well, I, I really like maps. Maps uh, are one of the most important human in inventions, and they are basic tools to explore the world, to communicate ideas, and manage our land, are really, and are really essential in land use planning. We can use maps in different stages of land use planning um, and to communicate ideas to stakeholders and make decisions based on maps. I found this when I was preparing this webinar and I, and I think it's very nice because it's in Anatolia, it's the, the first, the world oldest map is supposed to be, it's, it's there, it's from almost uh, 9,000 years ago and uh, well, you have a long history and tradition on maps, as you can see, and you probably know. And this bird eyes uh, view that we take for granted, like now we use Google Earth, it's very different from that old map. And um, it's, it's, it's a big step for human evolution. And it requires, it demands uh, a map making, formal map making requires that humans to be organized. Uh, to actually have this uh, bird view and formal map making. Nowadays, maps are, of course, very different. They have different, um, for example, you can have, you, you, we have graphical scales, numerical scales, a coordinate projection system, a legend, etc. And there is a new era in cartography, which is digi digital mapping. And digital maps have the same um, functionalities of paper maps, but they have extended, extended functionalities. And this, we can look at different areas, we can update them often, they can be interactive, etc. 
And this is possible because of the global positioning system, satellite network, because of computers and other technologies of the late years that have made this possible. And GIS in this context give us a, it's a great tool for a, working with different layers of information as we can see here. And data stratification is key for ELUP and for these types of projects because we work with multidimensional data. And we need to analyze, compare and visualize and manage these different layers of data. And this is something that uh, GIS is great for. So GIS, it's actually more than the software. We usually refer to GIS as the software, but there is also hardware, methods, data, human resources that use them. And regarding the software, uh, there is a question that we usually <laughs> ask ourselves and is which GIS software should we use? If, if, you, if you would like, um, maybe I will not read it now, but if you have experience in GIS and you work with a software and you can write it in the chat, I will then look at it. I probably think that if you do, you work with ArcGIS. And uh, well, it is a great software. There are many possibilities and you need to choose the one that, that is best for your objective. Some of them are more related to, are better to manage vector data, others for satellite derived data, and we will work today with um, QGIS. Why? Well, because QGIS, first of all, is a free and open source uh, GIS. It has many capabilities. Um, it, it works well with vector and raster data. And uh, there are many plugins that you can connect to G QGIS. And one of them, for example, is trends.earth which is um, one that we will take a look in our, and uh, on the next one, the other webinar. And with these plugins, you can do many, many things. We will uh, look today at some plugin for multi-criteria assessment, analysis, and, and also for analyzing digital elevation models. So this is, if you work with GIS, might be very basic, but maybe not all are familiar with these uh, terms. So I would like to talk about this for a second. There are two data models uh, in, in GIS. One is the raster and the other is vector. Spatial data has two components. One is the, the, the spatial, pos the position, the spatial data itself. Another and the other components are the attributes. So what is the difference between raster and vector data? Basically, how you, um, which is the, the, the data model you use for the positional information. So for raster, we use a grid. As you can see here, this is a uh, digital elevation model of IAS basin and uh, if, if you take a, a zoom in here we can see a grid and for each cell in the grid we have an average value for example of elevation elevation would be the attribute and the grid itself is the, the positional information the most common format for raster uh, images is, is the is the geotiff is the dot tiff is to, you get one file, which is the extension is TIFF. With vector data uh, in, in, in the raster data, we have a wall-to-wall -wall approach. We have values for all the area. We have a grid that covers the whole area. But with vector, we have three basic uh, forms for positional information. Points, lines, and polygons. And um, the most common format for, well, points, for example, in this example, in this map, sorry, here, this is the map of IH, and you, if you can see the points with different colors, they represent the location of uh, the sites where soil profiles were taken for this project. 
when, for, for, for example, lines are a collection of points, which could be rivers or roads, we will work with this data today with QGIS. And polygons represent areas. For example, I know a lake could be a polygon or an area where you, you know something is happening in particular. And the most common format that is used for this type of uh, data is a shapefile. This is a, a type of uh, file that comes from ESRI, which is the, the mother of ArcGIS. But um, there are other formats, for example, the geo package, which are more efficient uh, than the shapefiles, but still the shapefiles are the ones that are mostly used. And um, <clears throat> as you can see here, one shapefile is actually not one file. When you, when you have to send a shapefile to someone, you need to send many files and you will receive many files, not only the the, the one with the extension point SHA, SHP. You also get different, uh, different, different files that, um, for example, the DBF is the database, for, because for each feature here, for example, for each point, and a database is associated with different attributes. For, for example, for each point, we could have uh, electrical conductivity, soil organic carbon, uh, pH, etc. And that information is in this file. You also get the projection file and, and many other files. So talking about projection and spatial data, I will not go very um, deep into this because this is a, a whole, uh, uh, a lot of mathematical and physical information to actually uh, understand all of this. But um, there, there are two concepts that we will see now that are very important when we manage, uh, when we work with GIS and with the spatial data. One is that we need a geographic coordinate system to position our data. When we talk about latitude and longitude, we are using a geographic coordinate system. And for that, we need to refer these coordinates to an origin. For that, we need to represent the Earth somehow. And we know that the Earth is actually not like this. It's not a perfect sphere. Um, for example, <clears throat> the radius in the, in the equator is larger than, than in the poles, and it, it's not perfect. So um, there are different ways and different systems to uh, represent the Earth. One of the most common or mostly used ones is the World Geodetic System, WGS. And it, it allows us to reference our uh, geographic coordinate system. But to represent uh, this in a map, because this is a sphere, we need to put it in a planar surface, we need to project this into a planar surface. And as you know, a sphere is not a developable surface. And it means that if you need to, this is an example of an orange. Uh, if we have to put the peel of an orange in a plane, you will distort it. So maps necessarily distort uh, the data itself. And there are different ways to project, uh, different types of projection, of, of cartographic projections. And when we talk about projections, it's exactly that, that sense. If, if you see in this image, you have a lamp in the middle of of the, of the Earth, of the representation of the Earth, and you project it on different types of developable surfaces. What do I mean by developable surfaces? For example, if you use a cylinder, you can cut the cylinder here in the red line and you get a plane. So depending on the projection that you use, you will get different maps. For example, here we have the cylindrical projection, the conical projection, and the planar projection. And depending on where you place the surface is the projection you also will obtain. Why I'm talking about this? Because then we will have to use it. When, when we uh, obtain maps from different sources or when we download information from satellite, um, satellite information, we sometimes need to make transformations and make sure that we are uh, doing things. Right. 
These are three types of projections. I, I, I think it's very nice because, uh, for example, this is uh, the Mercator projection, which is a cylindrical projection. And you can see here Antarctica is huge. So is Greenland, it's uh, bigger than South America. And this is not true. Uh, actually, South America is bigger, that is larger than Greenland. So uh, the sizes are distorted with this projection. Uh, in this other projection, the Gal Peters projection, uh, the sizes are uh, relative to each other are better. As you can see, Greenland and Antarctica are so much smaller now than South America, but maybe the shapes are not so well. And, and I always like to show this projection. This is a planar projection because it's the one that we have in the United Nations logo, the azimuthal uh, projection. And this is a, a data set, a public data set, the EPSG geodetic data set, which is used by most GIS. And here, you, each country and each area can have a special, um, for example, you have a code, for example, for Turkey is the EPSG32637, which is, this is the, the, the datum and this is the projection and, and, and it is really good to make transformations. Okay. So for what are we doing for IASH and for our project and for land use planning? Well, we can use GIS to <clears throat> have all these different layers of geophysical parameters and variables that can help us in the process of uh, land use planning to work together with stakeholders participation. We can have land cover, land productivity trends, at the um, digital elevation model. And we can, for example, uh, with using GIS, calculate the area of each of the categories, as you probably know better than me. Uh, Ayash is mostly covered by arable land, 40% of the area, uh, followed by grasslands with bare area, 30%. And it, we are also adding other layers of information from global products, such as the um, FAO's Global Soil Organic Carbon. We will also obtain maps of soil characteristics from digital soil mapping from the results of the, um, of the lab. There are also many other products that are available and that are free. And we will talk about this also next webinar that you can download, for example, using Google Earth Engine, or you can work with them in the cloud. Uh, for example, fire intensity, or urban, or, or lights that give you an idea of uh, how of cities and, um, and, well, there are many, many products that could be useful. Of course, you always, uh, these are very general products and are, well, depending on the scale you are working, whether they will be useful or not. Um, that is why it is also important to work with uh, products at national level and at regional level and local level. And we know that, that Turkey has a lot of information that it could be really useful, for example, um, the potential for forestry activities map, the, the certification risk map, the water erosion map of Turkey. And these products uh, would be great to also um, use them for IASH and for the project and for land use planning. Okay, so how do we use this information? Well, first we have the information, how do we use it? How do we combine, combine it? And, and GIS offers the, us the opportunity to, for example, use multi-criteria analysis. In the previous webinar, I don't know if you've seen it or not, I showed this example of uh, this study that was uh, published uh, this year um, for Turkey, for Konya region, where they use different multi-criteria decision analysis techniques to make uh, beekeeping suitability maps. What is land suitability? Is uh, 
FAO defines land suitability as the fitness of a given land, of a given type of land for a defined use. So in this case, the defined use was beekeeping. So what they did, what, do you, what you do with multi-criteria uh, analysis, after you think of which is this final uh, use of the land that I'm aiming at, you uh, uh, define which are the limiting factors for this. For example, for beekeeping, bees need, uh, of course, plants. They need water, some sources of water, and <clears throat> Once you define all these limiting factors and you have maps for each of them, in this case, they use uh, then derived variables, topographic variables, climate variables, and many, many maps. Uh, you define the, um, the, for each criteria, which is the optimal range for beekeeping. And combined, combining them, there are many different uh, ways to analyze the data. Basically, what you do is, you give a weight to each of them. You can obtain, for example, this a type of maps, which are suitability maps. And here in red, we can see areas that are not suitable for beekeeping. And in green, <coughs> we see areas that are uh, very suitable for beekeeping. And this is, for example, a product that would be very useful to have for land use planning. And we can create suitability maps, for example, for uh, forestry activities or for a special type of a productive activity. Also, multi-criteria analysis is good to, uh, to make analysis of decision alternatives together with stakeholders. We can analyze how different decision alternatives um, will turn up. Good. And well, this is something we prepared together with Soledad Bastidas and um, it's very schematic. This is not true. Uh, um, this is, for example, one uh, is to keep our mind towards what we are aiming at in land use planning. We need to uh, define which um, areas are more appropriate for different uses, and for each of these, you can use different criteria. A a for example, areas of permanent forests are areas where we have forests, where we do not have, uh, where, for example, we have. Um, positive trends of land productivity, etc. Together, of course, uh, with a participatory approach and discussions with the stakeholders. Okay, so now, um, Cesar, I give the floor to Cesar. He will show you some uh, activities, some, some uh, practical exercise using vector data of IH Basin. Um, and he will give an introduction on how to download, use, and uh, QGIS. Um, so that is all for, for me now. Thank you very much. And I will stop sharing. Okay. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, okay, let me share my screen. I'm prepared here the, let me open the chat and everything. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. I assume yes. Okay. I will show you some things. I will let me, I think I will turn off my videos so you can get a better transmission of my screen. And also some web pages I want to show you, okay? I will just give a brief introduction to QGIS and also show you some example of how to open data and we can do a bit of a simple exercise. We don't have much time, but we will do something nice, I think. So first of all, um, 
QCIS, you can search in Google or anywhere for the name and you will be you will be taken to this page. This is the QCIS webpage where you can download the last version of QCIS. Um, there are different versions. Uh, I will open the change log. So if you come to download now, you probably will find um, some standalone versions. So depending on your computer, most of the computer now are 64 bit. You can, can check that in your computer and decide which version will you download. They normally have a new version. They update it every three months or something like that. And then they have one version that they update once a year. So this is a more stable version. So it's a very tested version and they put it here and they, it remains the same for a whole year. And this one usually has the more, more different or more updated uh, tools. This is a sheet uh, that is open source. So normally there are different tools that you can use, but we like this very much because it's easily to, to teach in courses. We use it with a lot of plugins and it's a very large community from different parts of the world. So this is, for example, this is a new version that was recently launched. You can see there are a lot of members from different institutions, educations and research and government. And this is just the, some of the new features that are in this new version. So they, they are growing uh, very quickly. Every time you see a new version coming, it's updates very quick. They have a lot of information and tutorial or how everything works. It's really, it's really advancing faster that you can keep track. And so it's a very good and complete uh, software for CIS. And the good thing is free. You can download it, you can share with anyone and, and you can start working right away. You can publish your data and, and you don't need to pay anything. So once you download it and you open it, this is uh, the window you will get. Uh, perhaps some news or if you have recent project, it will give you some of the recent projects. But for the first time, this is what you will see is very standard of many GIS. You have here in the middle the map canvas where your map and information will appear. And then you have some toolbars here with most of the commonly used tools. Uh, just to zoom, to save the projects, uh, open layers. We will see some of these soon. Um, and then you have uh, panels, a lot of different, this is a toolbox. So a lot of different toolbox here. Uh, one of the good things about QCIS is that they have their own tools, but they mostly connect to other software, like for example, Grass, which is uh, also one of the, of the first free GIS that was around, Saga GIS, and then you can download a, a lot of different plugins and tools that they all appear here. And, and when you go inside, you have different sort of tools. So it's a very complete, and how you can see, it's, there are a lot of tools and to do a lot of stuff. You also have the possibility of connecting to Python and R, so you can also program whatever uh, you need and is missing. Uh, you can also make a model builder, so there are a lot of different possibilities. And this is also, you have these different panels here that you can configure. It. I always, think I always recommend you can turn on and off. For example, if you don't like this one, you can make a space and then you can turn it on again if you want the tools at hand. But it's always good to have these two. Uh, for me, these are the main panel. This is the browser. So here is just like a file browser. I can go to my different hard drives and different folders and look for information. 
And here is where the layers, the layers I'm going to be opening will appear and I can manage my, my layers that I'm seeing. So let's just do that to see how it works. So Ingrid told, told us that you can have vector layers. These are the shape file. I'm using shape file because it's most, the most common the most common thing and also with other software, most of the software use shapefile, but as Ingrid mentioned, there are another uh, more efficient ways of storing vector data, Cesar, like geo packages. Sorry, can, yes. I interrupt you? Uh, can you put the, that, because we cannot see the maybe bigger, a bigger resolution, we cannot read anything, it is too, too, too small. Okay, no, I don't think I can no? okay. put it with a, um, oh, I don't know how I can do it. Uh, don't worry, sorry. Perhaps changing the resolution of the screen. Yeah, we can give it a shot. Um, let me see. Now, it, did it change? Not much. No, it got bigger here, but it didn't change there. Let me see if I choose. Something like this. Yeah, yeah, there I can see it better. Thank you. Okay. Good. Now this is too big for me. <laughs> but um, so here we have some shape files and some raster files. You can see this is a logo of a vector and a raster. And as I mentioned before, this is the browser, so I can go to any folder. For example, I have this one for the webinar, AS Data, and I can just uh, get, for example, this is a soil map. I can just double click and, and it appears. I can also, for example, if I have here my folder, let me see, I think it's in the other screen, yes. I can bring it here and for example, if I want to close this layer, I can just remove it from here. I can also come to here and add the same layer just by dragging and dropping the shape file inside. You see it opened the same file, but it changed the color. So most of the GIS software has this uh, functionality. When you open a file, uh, what you open in is a different elements and the different geometries. In this case, these are polygons and they normally open with a random color unless you already specify somewhere in the file some uh, particular style, it will open like, like that. And, and there are multiple ways to open files. You can also come here, this is the the main file opening window, you can uh, open vector, raster, mesh, uh, text files delimited by comma or any other differentiation. You can open geo packages, different sort of layers, uh, virtual layers, layers that are in the, in the internet, in different type of servers. Uh, everything can be open from this data source manager. But the easier is, of course, coming to the folder where you have the data, you just double click, or you can also, for example, this is the land cover, drag and drop, and it will also be open. So what do we do now that we started open layers? So the first thing I see now is that land cover is the last layer I, I see 
and it open on top of the other. I can change the other, the order of what I see just by moving this one on, on top of the other. So this is a nice here. So it's like you are looking from the top. So first you are looking at land cover and then to soil. But because one is covering the other, you can see only one. So let, for example, come to the soil one, which is has lesser units. And you can do uh, some of the first things you do normally when you open a layer is to explore the layer, what this layer contain, what information. So here, if you do a right click, or also if you double click on this name, you will be taken to the same place, which is the layer properties. Layer properties have information about this layer. So the name is Aya Soil, it's a S3 shape file. It's a multi-polygon layer, and it gives you some other data sources, also tells you which is the coordinate reference system. So this is projected in UTM. And here in symbology label, you can change and you can see and you can do a lot of actions. So for example, layer properties, this symbology is the representation here on, on my map. Uh, there are different things I can do here. I can just, I don't know, change the color if I like, something like this. I can also decide which is the color of the lines, the fill, and I also have different possibilities. For example, I can do categorize. Categorize, it will mean I will give to every polygon a color depending on a category. So which is the category? Here is value. Let me see what we have. Okay, we have BGT and area. These are two things that I have to choose. I will choose BGT, classify. And these are different soil types, for example. So every soil type gets a different color. I can change this color if I don't like the orange. I can double click, it will open yet another window and I can say, okay, this one instead of orange, I want a bit more red and there you go. And with that, I change the color of the different elements with the property in the database. So like Ingrid mentioned, every of these polygon here is associated to a database. Where is the database? Well, if you right click on the name again, you can go to this open attribute table. And this open attribute table will take us to the, let me make it smaller, <laughs> will take us to the attribute table. So I have 442 polygons and as I can see, for most of these polygons, I have these two uh, fields. One is the name of the soil, and the other is the area uh, of that polygon. So here is the information that I can use. I can use for these layers. We will see more examples later. And I have some tools here where I can zoom in, zoom out, but I can also move with my mouse. If I move the wheel of the mouse, forward, I can just make a little bit of a zoom in and I can use these tools. If you see every time I stop in a tool, it will tell me a little bit of what this tool does. So a bit of context information. This one, it's called identify features. So if I click on this one and then I click here, it will automatically open another window, which will contain information on this polygon. So for this case, it's a soil type B, and this is the area. If I click this one, it will be a soil type A, and this is the area. So as you can see, every figure is associated to some database where you have a lot of information. So that's the basic concept of 
uh, vector layers in, in a GIS system. So let me turn off this one. And you can see I still have selected, I can still select because I'm on this layer, I'm, I'm, I am on the selecting tool. So if I want this to stop, I can come and grab the hand and now I can move and nothing gets selected. This can be closed. Let me see then the other uh, layer that I have. No, just click here. This is the land cover. We can see what information we have here. We can go to the open attribute. And we will see this is a bigger attribute table. It has 21,463 small polygons for this area. And they have different things. They have ID, they have different codes. This is a land cover code. And then here are the land cover categories. Uh, these are in, in Turkish. And uh, here are some land cover categories, some names in English. So all of the information that I have here, I can use for something. I can uh, filter and select depending on the area, on the type of land cover. And we will do in a little bit an exercise about this. So I can also do the same and give some color to this layer if I double click, I can come to symbology and I can also color by giving a different color to every land cover. Uh, I can do like this. Come here where is the name of the land cover, classify, and every land cover will be given a different uh, color. So, here you have, it's a bit ugly. <laughs> Other thing you can do here is, for example, you can turn on and off any category. So you, if you are interested in seeing one category or not seeing one category, you can one by one put them on and off. So that was a possibility we didn't have before, but now that we categorize it with the land cover, I can choose what I want to see. If I, instead of land cover, I choose another of the layers, I can also do an, another of the fields in the database, I can also do the same. You can also have prepared style, styles, sorry. So here I already, once you change the color, you adjust the name, everything, you can save these styles to use later. That, that, that is what I did. And now I can load and style that I already prepared for this layer. So if I come here, I can come to AS data and load this style that I already prepared, load the style. And you see, it will change to the coloring I make. So now the map looks a bit better, at least for me. <laughs> maybe too pink still. But as you can see, I put arable lands in different tones of yellow. Uh, then you have all the different type of grasslands in different tone of pink, artificial in red, some blue for water, some permanent crops are in, in this type of green and in very dark green is the forest. So we can, uh, zoom in a little bit and explore the data. And also if you use this tool, you can come and check for every polygon, what is the information that we have. We have this different sort of information and uh, for every of this polygon. Good. Let me zoom out again. And let me open yet another layer. Another of the layers I have here is the study area. So this is our study area. I can put this probably on top. 
And I can use, for example, do a simple fill, just put a transparent fill and a surrounding line. So everything you can do here is very personalized. You can change mostly everything about this data. And I will open now the road information. So this is another layer. Ingrid mentioned that there were different type of layer. There were polygons, mostly what we've been using. And this, as you can see, is different. This is a line. So this layer is made of lines. And these are the roads. I probably can put this into a darker color, black. OK. And here we have the roads. Where are these roads being taken from? OK. This is also something interesting. You can get a lot of different information from different sources. I took this road, so we've been seeing this. I took this road from OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap is uh, similar to Google Earth. It has uh, a lot of, uh, sorry, from Google Map, it has a lot of information about the different, different things, the roads, the uh, different features that you can find in a map. And you can download from different sites. For example, here you can, if it is something very small, you can export it directly from here. But there are another interesting places, like this is the Geofabric, it's a repository. You can upload information from whole Europe. Or here by country, you can also download a lot of information about the in different format in shapefile or in different databases for the whole turkey or you can use also this overpass turbo is another option that is there here you can build queries to the database they have so for example here i put turkey and i ask for the administrative level boundaries uh, level four so this is what i get and I can just download only, only this. So there is a lot of information here. You can just go to OpenStreetMap and you will be able, from there, you will be referred to these different possibilities depending on what you want to do. There are some tutorials around that will teach you how to download information. And basically you can get a, roadmaps, boundary, a lot of information. So, okay, now we have a lot of data here. We have a land cover, we have our study area, we have roads. So I will make a very just short exercise to show you some of the very quick and simple functionalities. This is a bit the idea. The idea is to uh, look for, you know, like the example that Ingrid show about the beekeeping. The idea will be to make something similar. I mean, I want to do something in this, in this area, some specific land use, and I need to find areas that have woodland. These woodlands need to be far away from the road, more than 500 meters. And I also need to be close to the water. So I need to be less than seven and fifty hundred meters from a river or a lake. For example, if I want to do a suitability map or to find which are the places in this basin that I can do this type of line use, and these are my restrictions, this is what we are going to do now. Very quick, because I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> So the first thing we say is we need to have woodland. So we have a land cover map and we have woodland here in, in green. So remember we say we have a database. So usually in GIS, there are many ways of doing the same thing. For woodlands, I will just come to the database. And here I can filter, I can, I'm seeing the whole, all the 21,000 features, 
and I have zero selected. But I can come here and put a filter on a field. So if I open a filter and I choose the land use name, here I can start running woodland. So here is woodland. Oops. Here is the woodland. And if, if I press OK, I will get, as you can see here in this look name, all of the features I'm seeing, they are from Woodland. So I have filtered from the 21,000 units. I have only 213 in this table. The ones that are land use Woodland. So I can do something very simple. I can just come here to the edge and select every feature on this table. So here I have selected 213 features. So every feature is with woodland. Now, if I come to the map, I, I'm sorry, here you see all, to, all the woodlands are now yellow because I have selected all my woodlands. So now that all my woodlands are selected, I can come here where say I ask my land cover and export. And I can create a new shape file. So here I am in my layer. I ask land cover. I will just call this um, I ask uh, woodland. So I can create a new shape file and I can use this option here, say, save only selected features. Because I only selected the woodland, when I create my new shape file, you see it's already been open. I'm sure it will appear soon here also in my, in my folder. I have a new feature called IAS Woodland that only contains if I go to the attribute table, it only contains 213 features, which are my woodlands. So I make a new shape file only with my woodlands, because these are my areas of interest for this uh, exercise. So let me just turn this off aside. Now I have another uh, requirement that was 750 meters away from the water, uh, sorry, close to the water, less than 550 meters. This information is also in land cover. The land cover has information about the water, the, some of the rivers and some of the lake. So I can also take the information from there. But I can do a different way this time instead of building a new shape file, what I can do is to filter this uh, shape file here. The first thing I will do is to unselect everything. So this is, the button is to deselect everything. Now you see my woodlands are already green. And this is another approach at filtering. I can go to the layer and I can open here this option filter. And this will give me the query builder. Query builder, I can just select using the database uh, anything I want. So I'm focused on land, land use name. And here I can say, OK, show me which are all the possibilities from land use name. So here I have water bodies. I want water, so I will put land use names equal to water bodies. And I also have another one here, which is natural water bodies flowing. These are the rivers. So if this is a water body standing or if it's a water equals to natural water bodies, I'm interested in those places. Then I say, okay. Oops. I don't know why it's taking so long. Let 
let me see. Okay. So here, as you can see now, my land cover only shows me these features I have selected. Doesn't show any other land cover. Uh, and if I go to the attribute table, the attribute table only will contain these features. So it's almost the same as if I created a new one because every operation I do now with this land cover will only be done on these features that you can see. The other features, the ones that are from other land covers that are uh, because I have this filter will not be processed. So here I can run one of the tools that I need to define uh, the 750 meters uh, range. This is the geoprocessing tool. I have this tool here called buffer. So what I can do here now is take my IAS land cover. And here in distance, I will put 500, uh, sorry, 750 meters. I have also here an option that means dissolve. Uh, I will click this one and I will show you what it does. And I can save this to a file. This will be my uh, water buffer. Seven fifty. And run. Okay, this is what I get now. <laughs> if I overlay this, this will be showing me which are these areas that are closer to 750. I can put here my land cover. So this buffer is 750 meters from any water source. And this in brown are my forests. So here I can see where I have a coincidence between these two criteria. Why did I click dissolve? Because as you can see, there were a lot of different um, uh, elements in this land cover. So this was one element, this one was element. If I don't use dissolve, it will make just a polygon 750 uh, 50 meters around of each of the features will be a single different feature. But because I put dissolve, every boundary in between these two, it's eliminated. And now, for example, if I come here to my water buffer and I select this one, you see this is a single huge uh, polygon where everything is connected. And in this case, it was better like that. So I have the first two elements. I have the, um, the water, the 750, and my forest. What I can do next, next, I can come here to the vector. Here you see there are most of the, not most, but the, the common uh, QGIS uh, tools for vectors. As I mentioned before, here is a huge processing toolbox with a lot of vector tools to complement this one but this is easier for this example because it has different uh, small drawings that will tell you what this tool does. Uh, what I want to do here is clearly this one, intersection. So where these two layers meet, so I have the water buffer and the woodland. I want to see where these two are together. I will save this to a file and I will put this um, wood uh, water. Okay, run. Let me put it on top. Okay, and now we see 
In this red color are all the areas. If I turn off the, the other ones, I already created a shape file where I have this thing. Areas that have woodlands and are closer to the water by 750 meters. I have yet another criteria that they need to be far away from the road because what I'm going to do doesn't require to be close to the roads. Maybe the roads are too stressful for the animals I'm going to take there. So I have my roads here. I think we, we can skip this because we are running out of time. Okay. And, and finish with only two criteria and maybe show the plugins. Okay. So here, just to mention is it will be the same to the rows you can make a buffer and then uh, you can remove these areas that are 500 meters here in the vector you have all these different possibilities uh, you can use the union so where two layers meet you can use the difference for example where the roads are just take this piece out this is the one you will have to use so you can make it manually like this, for example, to make a suitability map, or you can also do different plugins. Uh, here, for example, there is something in plugins, you have the plugin manager. It will open this window here. And here I already made a search. I just put criteria for criteria and you get different plugins that have been developed from different people that you can install and you can try. Uh, this is just pressing, for example, this is not installed, you can install and, and just run it. And here to show you too, also, there are some tutorials in Cushy's webpage about multi-criteria overlay. Of course, you can do this this is using all free data from the, uh, the, the same places I, I got it from OpenStreetMap. And, and they convert it to raster and they do the most multi criteria analysis in raster. So you can go you, using the raster different plugins. This is a raster plugin that was already there. Or you can use, for example, for vector. Uh, if you can also to the page of QCIS, you will have here a lot of information about every plugin. They, they have the code, so it's free, and you can also look at what the different methodology it is. Some plugins like these are also well documented. You have here a, a tutorial on how to run this plugin. These plugins work for Vector, and it has different models that you can use to do multi-criteria uh, assessment. What I just was doing here is just not a wall-to-wall -wall approach. It's just to choose which are the areas. I only want to see these polygons, but you can use different methods like the one they will be keeping that English show. You can get a whole map of the study area. The, and you can see, okay, which are the best places, which are the average places and the worst places. So you can just, keep a little bit or you can do a wall-to-wall -wall approach in vector or in raster depending on which data you have but there are different tools that you can use and different approaches yeah so i will continue later with the raster and elevation ingrid then i give the word back to you i don't know if there are some questions from participants or we do it at the end If, if there are any, any questions regarding this, maybe we can uh, answer them now, or should we continue to work with the digital elevation models? I think there is no question. Okay. So uh, if you let me share the screen, Cesar.
Okay, so since I just showed you a little bit of how easy it is to work with QGIS, um, I strongly encourage you, if you are GIS users and you are working with other uh, software, to take a look at QGIS. And, <clears throat> and well, he showed a very uh, simple way to obtaining uh, suitability maps for a specific uh, use. Um, and now, I will give a very brief presentation on uh, an introduction on using satellite derived data. And then Cesar will continue working with uh, digital elevation models for IH basing. So <clears throat> remote sensing is a very broad term. Satellite satellites are just one of the platforms by which we can obtain remote sense data. Um, remote sensing is defined as the acquisition of information without making a physical contact with the object. So I always bring an example from history, which is good to enlighten us. And uh, in World War I, uh, for example, they used pigeons uh, with cameras to obtain pictures and information. And this is also a type of remote sensing. A remote sensing platform could be also a live one. Um, in 1957, um, the first satellite was uh, sent to space, which was the Sputnik. And nowadays we have so many satellites that are uh, surrounding us and obtaining lots of information. Um, I think it's good to to keep up with all the information that is available because it could be very useful and it's free. And well, uh, there are different types of orbits of uh, satellites, the geostationary, which go from west to east over the equator and they keep the same direction uh, and rate of the Earth, so they show always the same area. And also the polar orbits, this is an example of how they allow to map the whole world. Uh, by polar orbiting our planet. And like this, we can obtain, for example, mosaics, which are composite, they come from the composition of several satellite Im images. Also, it's good to, especially if we're going to work with uh, digital elevation models, I think it's good to um, remember that they are, there are two different ways of uh, obtaining information, to, two different types of sensors on board of satellites. Some are active and some are passive. Passive means that they, uh, this, is, this is the example of passive, which the sun, the, the light from the sun is reflected and that is what the, the sensor in the satellite um, captures. Um, active is the, the same, the same uh, satellite um, sends information, sends uh, energy, and that is what it gets back. For example, uh, at the radar wavelengths. So each sensor can obtain and, and measure the, the energy at different ranges of the, of the spectrum. And this is what we call bands. You know, we, we have Depending on the on the wavelength, for example, the visible light uh, is very very narrow. As you can see, this is what we can see. But uh, some satellites also see infrared, some sensors, and other uh, portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. I will go quickly on this because it's just to give a, an idea. Different uh, satellites have sensors that can perceive information at different ranges of the, uh, at different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. And here we can see what we call bands, depending on which area, which energy they are perceiving. So, and then we can mix these different bands and, and <clears throat> emphasize the information that we want to see. For example, uh, if we, we can mix the red, the blue, and paint it in, the, in these colors and the green. And here, for example, we can see uh, easily see the land cover in this, in this image, for example. We can um, 
see urban areas, we can see areas where vegetation is green or not. And <clears throat> this is a, a, a broad a world to explore and to get information and it's really good to, for example, for land cover, we can also measure a, a changes in this, in, in time, changes in land cover, we can uh, mix different bands to enhance vegetation and this is what the vegetation index is doing and we will go deeper on this on one of our webinars uh, NDVI, EVI, SAVI, there are many vegetation indexes with mix, mix for example the, the red and the near infrared bands of um, the um, information and we can uh, see for example with many dates in a temporal resolution we can see how vegetation is in uh, the productivity is increasing or is decreasing and this is really good for land degradation for monitor monitoring and mapping land degradation also we can use uh, this information satellite derived information to map soil salinity we will not use this for is because we we have uh, the information from the soil sampling, um, but it is also a, a use. And also with the active um, uh, satellites, we can uh, model elevation and have the digital elevation models. Um, well, this I already said that remote sensing is it's a great a tool for um, mapping land degradation. And well, uh, digital ele elevation mo models can be produced not only by remote sensing in, uh, information, but, uh, but also by topographic services, service. Um, they produce relief maps, and they can be represented as raster or as, uh, or as vector base uh, using the triangular irregular networks, but they are commonly used using remote sensing data and uh, as rest raster um, layers. Oh, this picture shouldn't be there. <laughs> I don't know why. But the shuttle radar topography mission, uh, which was flown in, in, in 2000, uh, we kind of gives information for a 90 meter resolution uh, digital elevation model. And it was later um, a product at 30 meter resolution was um, launched and it is free and it is for the, almost the whole earth. Um, it can be downloaded from internet. Here we can see, for example, the 90 meter resolution DEM for Ayash. Now Cesar will show you this with more detail, also the 30 meter resolution and a five meter resolution digital elevation model. And the great thing about this is that we do not only get elevation, we can derive many other uh, variables such as slope, which is, uh, for example, a very important variable to uh, measure um, and estimate the risk of erosion, for example, or for, <clears throat> for these suitability maps could be a, a very good uh, variable to consider. Um, we can derive aspect, whether it is facing north, south, east, or west, west or east, actually. Um, there are also other topographic indexes that you don't even need to calculate them. They, they, you can download them um, directly from the internet. So I was very quick because we are running out of time. And I give back the floor to Cesar. Uh, so that he can work on the digital elevation models of IS Basin and show you how to obtain all these derived data and how to, um, one of the good things, for example, I told you that we have three different digital elevation models for IS. So which one do we use? What are the, the, how do we explore these digital elevation models? How do we see which is best or which is, or if there are any problems in one of them? Um, um, how do we obtain these uh, variables derived from them using QGIS? Thank you. Okay. And I will... okay. So, if there is a question about the last section or what English has said, just let me know. We have 15 minutes or so, Cesar. Okay, so I will try to make it quick. 
Um, but anyway, questions are very welcome, so please uh, just let me know, interrupt me if there is any. Um, so here, are you already in my screen again? Okay, this is where we stop. Um, here I have already some um, uh, DMs, like English show. This is the 90 meter, this is the 30, and this is a five meters. I can open this all together here, and we can perhaps explore a little bit. I will put the five on top. 30 and 90. Okay, now if we zoom a little bit, if we look from here, from the distance, the whole basin, if I turn on and off, you cannot see much of a difference between the five, the 30 and the thing, but if we get closer, uh, probably when we start coloring, we will be able to see the pixels, the pixel size. But just to give you an idea, we can just go to any of this and look with our inquiry tool. And what we will get is as English show. So for every pixel, I will just get a, an elevation. So basically this is a matrix and every cell has only one value. Okay, so what are these different sources uh, of elevation come? Okay, there are different places that you can download data. There is a lot of data available, as, as English say, uh, you need to find what is there and then decide which one to use. Uh, make a bit of a quality check and controls. Um, here is this Earth Explorer, all of this uh, SRTM, this uh, DM, 90 meters and the 30 meters are coming from here. Um, then you have this uh, ALOS. Let me turn off the video. Then you have here also, I'm not adding this to the example, but this is Alos Pulsar, is another option, is a 12.5 meter, meter, uh, meter resolution uh, DEM. Uh, here from CGR, there is also the source of the 90 meter DEM, Digital Elevation Database. This is also very easy. All of these are freely available, so you just need to find the button that says on load data like here and then you can just click in the in the place you are and you can get uh, s riaski or geodiff with the dem from your area this is one of the best i mean is a 90 meters but it's very it's been around for many years and it's really it's really good then there are this combination. This is a new version of the Aster GDEM. This combines the Aster with the SRTM, and this is 30 meter resolution. Also, is, is the newest product from NASA. And also, we download a lot from Google Earth Engine. This is to connect with the next uh, webinar. So, here you have most of the, the same sources. So, this is the 90 meter elevation product from CGR. Uh, you can also use it directly and process it in Google Earth Engine and you can also download it from here. Um, just to show you that there are different possibilities. And the, the, the thing is that then you need to see, okay, depending on what your project is, your, your, the size of your study area, if you are working in a national level, perhaps 90 meters is more than enough. And if you are working in, in a smaller area, you may need some more resolution. So here I have to show you some basic tools. This also works in the same way that before. You can come to symbology and there are perhaps different options, but you can also color the DM using different uh, different colors. You have a huge options on palette. You, you can go here like 
very deep in, let me see, my screen is a bit big and I cannot see where the things are opening. Okay, here I have also some a specific palette for topography. So um, there are a lot of options that you can put here uh, just to make uh, to make it look nice and change the color and perhaps be a bit, a bit more descriptive. So here is color from 400 meters to 1,600 meters in this color range from greens to browns and white. And perhaps here you can more easily see the pixels of these different products. Uh, I will compare them now. I already have a project, so I don't lose time putting color to, to all of these. Also, you can copy the style. And for example, I can quickly paste the style on these two. So now they all have the same style. And if I maybe zoom here, I can see the difference. I don't know if you can see between the 90 meter pixel and the 30 meter pixels. And here maybe is a difference between the five meter pixel you see is much more smoother. And there are a lot of tools that you can use to manage and explore the DM. Most of the tools are here in raster. If you come to analysis, you will find here tools like a slope, uh, which is to measure the slope, a aspect which shows you which were the orientation of the slopes are, if they are facing north, they are facing east, west. This is very important because sometimes the, the northern slope have a different humidity, a different evapotranspiration and a different vegetation than the southern slopes. So it's a very important variable to compute. And also the hill shade, Hill shade is a, a ren rendering of the, I can quickly show you. So you can, you can choose a light source and it will simply create a layer containing lights and shadows, give you, giving you this texture of a, like a 3D texture and help you explore much better uh, your DM. Now, just let me close this project and I will open a new project. I already have calculated the slope, aspect, and all these variables for the different DEMs. So here is a 90 meter DEM. What did I do here? I just calculated just give the same colors that I showed you before and added this ill shade. Uh, here, the only trick is if this is normal coloring, you will see this coloring, just the layer, the DM, because it's on top. But if I can put here in blending more, if I put multiply, this is a special option where I can see the colors of these first layers, but also the texture or the color of the layer that is behind. And here behind is my hill shade that I just showed you before. So I can see a, a color version of my hill shade, which uh, helps me better to understand where are the high places, where are the valleys. And here we can also compare, for example, this with the 30 meter resolution. You see, uh, perhaps it's much, uh, it's much better. Can you see if I put the 90 meters and the 30 meters, you can see a bit more of detail. And I can also add at the five meter resolution. So here we are at the edge and you can see here in one side, the five meter DM and here in the other side of the line, you can see the 30 meter resolution. So obviously five meter is much better <laughs> than 30 meters. This gives you the, the, the bigger the pixel size, this is the 90 meter. It's give you a smoother version. So 
But at the end, these are all models. So this is a raster model. Uh, you can build it as Ingrid say from different satellites, uh, passive satellites, like uh, different images from different angles, a stereoscopy. Uh, you can use uh, radar information like the SRTM mission. Uh, you can use LIDAR, drones, different things in order to get these this different DMs. Of course, every, every DM has the particularities. Uh, as you can see, the five meters allows you to see a lot of things that if you put the 90 meters, you will not. So this is very, very clear. That more resolution is better. <laughs> But not always is the case. You can, you can check different things. Uh, for example, here, I also calculated the slope. This is the slope of the 90 meter DEM. So here, darker places are flatter and, and whiter places uh, have the slope, more slope. So if we put back this back and I put my slope on top, perhaps we can see here at the edge of these mountains where the slope is going up, you see the lighter places where the slope is, is higher. And when you put the slope on the different maps, let me turn on the slope on, on all of this. So this is the slope of the 30 meters. And this is a slope of the five meters. Yeah. One of the interesting things to see, I, I always check the slope because in the slope, you see a lot of different uh, things about how this DM was modeled. So as you can see here, there are a bit of a, I don't know if you can notice some strange or uh, lines here in the 90 meter resolution. Not many, but there are some. If you go to the 30 meter resolution and you zoom in, you will see some of these lines too, uh, a bit more often. And if you go to the five meter uh, resolution uh, here in the slope, and if you also zoom in, you will see also some straight lines like here, different black lines, and also some uh, uh, white lines that appear to be kind of like contour lines. So because of this is always a, a different models, all of the models have issue, I mean, the, some, some kind of problems. And when you, project these models. Uh, for example, this 90 meters DM was produced uh, or, or is distributed in a geographic information system, in a geographic coordinate. And if you want to project it into a flat area, you kind of, this, you, you, you make some distortions in the map. And, and when you make this distortion, these kind of things happen. What is the implication of this? Well, it depends on what are you going to use your DEM for? Uh, what is the information that you are going to take? Uh, if you are going to do soil erosion and you have a, uh, and the slope is very important uh, and you have these, these things, it perhaps affect your maps and give you some strange result that then you need to correct. So it's very good to explore the data first um, and see what happens. And for that, there is a very nice plugin uh, here. Um, it's called here, Manage Plugin. There are a lot of plugins that are profiles, profile tools. So if you put this profile tools, there are different plugins uh, with different profile tools. Uh, this Kuprov is also a good plugin. And you can basically use any of these tools to make a, a profile. Let me see if I can find my profile plugin. 
everything was here. Okay. I don't know why I cannot find it. Commercial. We, we have five minutes to wrap up, Cesar, so that we can have questions. Okay, good. Then I will see if I find it. It was the icon here, but it's not anymore. Okay. So you can use any of this profile to make a 3D, to make a line and to make a 3D of your, of your study area and see how the, the profile of the different DMs and, and slope are distributed. But a good thing that you can do also to, to see how the DMs are behaving, the best thing that you can, you can try, it's always to delineate uh, watersheds. So there are some different tools to delineate watersheds that you can use. Uh, here in your toolbox, you can search for watershed and there is this watershed tool from uh, Grass GIS. You just simple put, put, simply put your elevation map. And for example, I already have it here. You can have a, a lot of information, but very interestingly, you can also have the river networks distribution. And you can basically put on this on top of uh, different maps. You can use, for example, uh, I can use here a pink map. Oh, let me. Get the Bing satellite. Okay. So I can put here a, a image from Bing and I can see here with my basin where my river network is. And that's give you a pretty good idea if the DM is working uh, well or if having a lot of errors. So you can see this is the 90 meter resolution DM. Uh, there are some rivers that you can see in the image and for the resolution is very good. So the water is flowing the, the way it's supposed to flow, is following the river. So depending on the modeling you are doing, this can be a good option. And also here I was preparing this also for the same five meter uh, DM. These are the streams of the five meter DM. And you can see, for example, here, how these streams are, are following what you can see on the high resolution image below. So does this give you an indication on how good, there are some areas where some errors or some strange things are happening but mostly you can see how this DM is behaving and is following what you can see in the image. I mean, where you see a river or where you see drainage lines in the fields, you can see that the model is also finding this as a, as a streams or, or, or places for the water to, to run just across the road. So this gives you a pretty good idea of how these different models are working. So it's really good to use this watershed tool and always try to delineate the river network because it helps you understand if the product that you have is where it's working good, where, when it's, where it's accurate, where there are problems, perhaps these areas are too flat or have been a lot of issues here that make uh, the model get some confusion, but it gives you a good idea of how things are working. And also other things that Ingrid mentioned, different indexes. Uh, basically, uh, you can derive a slope, um, which is uh, this one we saw. Also a very useful is the aspect so here we have the aspect 
derived into categories. So places that are looking to north are in green, to south uh, are in yellow. So this also correlates sometimes very well with, the, um, with what you see in mountain regions, that when you have some slopes, uh, the vegetation behaves different depending on, on the angle they are looking to the sun. So it's a very important variable, but then you can also derive another things like this one. This is a map of landforms. Uh, you can classify it if you are in a peak, if you are in a valley, if you are in a slope, if the slope is very intensive or if the slope is just a, the, the upper part of the slope, the lower part of the slope. So there are a lot of different indexes. Uh, from here, you can see this is an extract from Google Earth Engine where you can directly download these indexes, the landform, the Chile, which give you some idea of evapotranspiration because it also looks at where the the depending on the angle that the, the the slope is facing, if you will get more sun or less sun, and you can use to to account for evapotranspiration, sun topographic diversity index that could be related to soil erosion, and and there are a lot of different possibilities index like this that you can get from Google Earth Engine. But you can also use some tools in GIS. You have this very nice tool from GRASS, which is called Slope and Aspect, that can give you also profile curvature and tangential curvatures and different derivatives of the slopes. And, and also Saga has another module that is called Slope, Aspect, and Curvature. And you can choose from many different, uh, these are these, the papers that describe different type of uh, uh, indexes that you can use with you when you have a DM to, to make maps for different variables and different use. If you are looking at erosion or, or, or different things. And here you can just put, if you put a slope, just to show you one more thing. So here are the, the different, um, these ones that I showed you before, the slope, aspect, and curvature. So these are from different software, GRASS and Saga, but they are already integrated all in QGIS. So if you have a DM, you can just come here, put your DM, and then you can choose uh, which of these different methodologies you want to use and which index you want to calculate. So just to show you a quick overview, there are a lot of different tools uh, ready and very easy to use uh, with a DEM to delineate basin, to delineate streams, and to delineate or to calculate different uh, indicators for, for digital elevation mapping. Okay, I will stop here. So there is time for questions. If there is any question. Okay. It was quite fast. <laughs> Very little time to show a lot of things. Okay, thank you Ingrid and Cesar, thank you very much. And Mustafa Bey sanırım sizin sorunuz vardı. I think Mustafa has a question. I have a question. Uh, well, I, I'd like to thank Caesar and Ingrid indeed for their very nice presentations, especially about about uh, the presentation on raster data. It was quick. So I wish we had more detailed presentation on raster data. That was that was a piece of information that I want to share. The resolution of five meters, thirty meters, and ninety meters in relation to EM. When we look at their overlapping with the image, especially image data from 90 and 30, are not overlapping with the actual object, actual imagery, but five meter, five meter is better. Uh, but there are still significant mistakes in the five meters, but the mistakes might be occurring because of the development of the DEM. There might be a maze, corn, 
for example, in, in a land. Uh, so the image only shows the top of the maze. That is why the mistake occurs. And, or if there, there are lots of rocks uh, in a mountain, so, if the, so the image cannot go through under the rock. That is why some mistakes might occur. Do you, especially for the use of five meters EEM, do you have any suggestions in mind that that you can that you can give us so that we can make five meter resolution better, the the DEM better? And you also showed the stream in five meter resolution. We saw some streams, some segments of the stream in the in the croplands, for example, this this cannot be the truth. So there has to be a mistake. So, do you have any analysis suggestion in your mind for us to 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 compensate for these mistakes, to to correct those mistakes in five meters? Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, I one of the thing I I also here I wanted to show you. Here I found my profile tool. <laughs> um, so here you can basically, let me just show you something. Uh, so this is the slope. Okay, at here. So here you can just put a DM and you will get this uh, profile. So it's like a slice of, uh, of an area. Um, and this is nice because you can explore the difference between the different uh, DM. Let me put the five meters here and, and we can we can chat about it. Uh, add layer. Wait, because I have increased the resolution, then I cannot see anything in my screen. <laughs> Let me see here. If I can put this back here, okay. Uh, No, I think I make a mistake. Okay. Now I wanted to show you a better comparison with the two different DMs. Uh, I I've been exploring this a little bit, and what what you have here is that uh, perhaps now I can. Ah, okay. No, I can. Uh, it's true. If you if you check this uh, DM, you can see there are a lot of issues, and sometimes there are some errors in the data, like here. Uh, and this, when you see this in the in the image below, uh, this corresponds uh, to some trees, and also you can see here some uh, scales here. So when, when you when you check uh, the five meter DM and, and when you make a zoom, you see that there are like uh, shams. So you have a flat area and then go down, a flat area and then go down. And the model should be something like the black line. So uh, something smooth. And, and this is, yeah, because of the, of the origin of the data, uh, Normally, when you do a stereoscopy or when you use um, images from different, uh, with different view that come from satellite or drones, uh, you need to do some processing in order to remove the trees and to remove these things. Uh, the, the thing you can do here with, with the, I mean, the, there are works you can do if you have the original data, perhaps, process it in a different way. Uh, so you don't have this, this sort of, of things here. That they look like a terracing. Uh, there are some ways to removing trees, but always that you remove these trees, you have to, you produce some, a bit of uh, artifacts. Uh, one of the methodology that sure, I sure, found, sure. one that worked Good for az, az önceki aşağıda direklerle thing. alakalı bir yer vardı. Direk, e, direklerin geçtiği bir alan var. E, aha, so it was the, the, that one, there was this region with the pools. Well, that, that one actually. 
this is a mistake that one how, how we can really remove this mistake how can mm. we correct it that is the question like i think that these are the electrical masts electrical poles how can we can how can we correct this mistake this is a mistake yeah this you can probably mask uh, make a mask and, and make an interpolation i think you should try you can try something like that. But you will change. But it is not creating a big problem, but but then creating slope or we might come across important mistakes. But there's a local, some localized mistake. But sometimes we might encounter many mistakes at once. As you can he see here, these are trees, which are a mistake. If we cannot remove them, then there will be mistakes in the slopes that we generate. So in order to in order to correct those mistakes, do you have any method in mind? They're not creating a big problem problem for the time being, but they may create a problem in the in the future. So any suggestions in your mind that you can make to us? There's there's not a well or something. There's not a pit or something in here. This is a mistake. That one also is a mistake. Yes. Yeah. As you can see. The, this top of mistake is type of um, this are hole. I haven't tested, but there is a tool here that you can you can use. Uh, the, it's, in, it's called a pit uh, or pit removal or filling gaps. Uh, it's a way of making uh, sure that the DM doesn't mm -hmm. have any of these holes. Uh, is this Come one? On. So this one is Somehow. a kind of a filter that produces depressionless elevation layer. So if you okay. model hydrology here, once the water gets into this hole, it will not be able to get out. So what this tool does is apply a filter and try to fill these holes mm -hmm. with data. So it will, it will probably solve, solve some of the mistakes in, in the DEM. Uh, so some of the mistakes maybe are solvable, solvable with this type of filter. Çok küçük, e, yani çok küçük problemleri çöküyor, çözüyor ama büyük problemlerde sıkıntı. Well, uh, I think it 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 solves the small problem, small, small problems, but it may not uh, solve the big problems. But still, says I thank you very much for this nice explanation. Okay, there is also another way that you can do is you, you can put your DM into a tin format. So you can make a transform this DM into, into a mesh. This is a vector model, uh, the triangulator irregular network. You can, you can put it into that and then you can convert it into raster again. Yeah. Uh, so you will basically reduce the çözüm, çözüm yani, we, we tried it we tried it and it is not creating any solution unfortunately mm. not and and you have the original data that created this dm so this dm come from a, a stereoscopy images or is it a light how what is the original data We have this five meter DEM for IASH, let's say, and this is the problem that we generally see in, in this. And in our land studies, in 30 meters DEM or 10 meters DEM that we create using a machinery uh, come with mistakes. If you do not do manual correction generally you, you see such mistakes they say they say in the digital models as well well you know turkish soil is quite rugged full of slopes and rugged terrain that is why the maps really come with lots of mistakes generally large mistakes unfortunately mm -hmm. and we don't know how to compensate for that yeah um, yeah Yeah, it's complicated, uh, but if you have the original yes. data that originated this DM, uh, the, the DM, this DM was created using uh, 
I don't know, by the look of it, it was created Burada using stereoscopy images. Burada ağaçlar var mesela. Images. Bu yoğun olduğu zaman ciddi hatalar oluşuyor. For yani example, bu... you have some trees, it can be over, overlooked for the time being, but if the trees are so much, so many, so intensive, then you cannot overlook it, because if the trees are so many in the agricultural land, then what to do? I don't know, we have to do, we have to really make lots of effort in order to eliminate them. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, I, I think you have these sort of things, the, the trees, then there are these, uh, these gaps here, and then there are these uh, contour lines here that when you, when you drive a line, you can see here that uh, this, this also pattern of... Az önce gösterilen elektrik, elektrik direkleriydi. Elektrik direkleri... I think the previous ones were the, were the power plant uh, transmission lines, power plant transmission masts or something. So it also is creating lots of problems. They are called high voltage transmission lines. And I think that's what we see. Uh, okay. Yes. These are high voltage transmission lines of the power plants, energy power plants. They are not pits, they're not holes actually, they are otherwise, they, they are quite reversed, they're elevated things, they are the masts, electricity masts. Yeah, one thing you can always do is to do a pit, uh, this fill gap in order to fill some gaps, and then you can use another filter to, to, to try to remove the error, but that will change the DM resolution, you will be passing to from five meters, for example, if you go to 10 meters or 15 meters, uh, you can remodel them at a higher resolution. In, in, in this type of remodeling, perhaps you can get rid of a lot of mistake, but you will also lose a, a lot of resolution because uh, instead yes. of five meters, you will have 15 meters. So it's kind of a trade-off, but but if you see when when you see the water the water uh, the water lines in in many places the DM is quite is quite good it's really capturing the 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 water and everything but yeah I if you want I can try a little bit I will try in a little in a little bit uh, of of place. You know some solution and I will... We would be more than glad if you can try it sometime. Try okay. to, 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 to uh, I mean, solve this mistake. But so you, you only have the DM, you don't have the data that originated the DM. Sadece model var elimizde. Just the model, just the model. No, the model. no, not the original okay. data. No. Because with the original data, you probably can solve it more, more easily. Tabii ki. But um, of course, of if, course. But if you don't have the original data and the model, yeah, you only can fix some things. You can fix. Evet. Uh, but normally, when you fix something, you break another thing. <laughs> so. We have to be careful not to break anything. Yeah. Okay, but I will. I will. I thank will try you. a little thank bit. Thank you. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. Another question from the floor. No, I think not. Okay, in the absence of questions, I'd like to declare the session closed. Mrs. Sarah, would you like to say anything to wrap up the session, to close the session? Thank you very much. No, just thanks for everyone's participation. I have nothing else to add. Okay, okay then. Thank you indeed, Ingrid and Cesar. Thank you for the for, for your nice presentations and thank you all for the participation and contribution and I'd like to thank our interpreters uh, Dennis and Kyal for their interpretation and if you have any 
questions later for Cesar or Ingrid, you can always contact us and we can get your answers later. See you in the third webinar. Eileen, I'm sorry, are we going to have access to the video recordings of today's webinar? Who are we going to approach for the video? My colleagues uh, have already recorded the webinar, both in Turkish and English, and we will be sharing the link with you. Thank you very much for everything, for all the organization. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you in the next Thank webinar. You. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Denise and Kia. Thank you.